everyone. We are going to wait a minute or two before we get started to let everyone um, have a chance to log, log on. Where is everyone tuning in from? Feel free to respond in the chat. Got Massachusetts and Seattle. Just give it another minute or two. Okay, we'll give it one more minute and then we can get started. Okay, Hi. let's get started. Hi everyone, welcome. Uh, my name is Paulina, I am Book Larder staff and I'd like to thank you all, uh, wherever you're tuning in from, from, for joining us today for our author talk with Durkani Ayubi for her beautiful new book, Parwana. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Book Larder, we are a cookbook store here in the Fremont neighborhood of Seattle. Uh, typically, we host these author talks in person, but of course, with COVID, we haven't been able to do so. And so we've transitioned completely online. And I like to say that one silver lining to all of it is that even though we miss having people in the store, it's provided us a wonderful opportunity to host authors and interviewers and even attendees from all over the world. Um, Turkani is tuning in from Australia where it's um, early in the morning. So it's been a huge silver lining and, and a really neat experience. And if you're interested in checking out uh, more of our author talks, we do record these and post them on our Book Larder YouTube channel. So you can find all of them there and you'll find uh, this author talk uh, within the next 48 hours on our, on our channel. Um, today's author talk, um, Drakani will be talking about her book and you'll find that if you haven't had a chance to look at it, that not only does she share beautiful recipes um, from her family, but also her family's story. And I'm really excited to learn more about that in today's author talk. And she will be in conversation with Olaya, who is a good friend of the store and is the founder of Lioness, a um, website that empowers uh, women and it's for women. It's really wonderful. Um, check it out. Um, today's author talk is going to be about, the conversation will be about 45, 50 minutes, and we will leave the last uh, 10 to 15 for Q&A uh, questions from you all. So if you have any questions for Dakani, uh, you'll see at the bottom of your screen a Q&A uh, sidebar. And 
please direct all of your questions there. And at the end, Olaya will go through them and read them out loud. And I also in the chat um, have copy and pasted a link to our website where you can order signed copies of Parwana if you haven't done so already. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Durkani and Olaya. Hello, how is everyone? <laughs> Um, welcome everybody. Welcome to Connie. I'm so excited to speak with you today. Um, I wanted to start by congratulating you on creating just a stunning cookbook. And I just want to take a minute for people who are at home, if they haven't had a chance to look at it, it is truly one of the most gorgeous cookbooks I've seen in ages. Like every page that you open to, I'm just like, I want to cook this, I want to cook this, like, I had to take out all my sticky notes for this, because I have so I mean, like, everything I look at, I'm like, okay, that's on my list, that's on my list. So anyway, I just want to take a minute to congratulate you on creating a book that's not only beautiful, the recipes look amazing. I'm so excited to cook for it. I mean, there's so many cookbooks that come out, and this one really caught my interest as being mm. phenomenal. So congratulations on that. Thanks so much, Alaya. Um, for me and creating the cookbook, you know, I almost see myself as a vessel, an intermediary, because these were like my mom's recipes um, and some of them are my sister's recipes. And, you know, I was, I just have had the very good fortune of being able to work with my family to create and, you know, lots of other very talented people um, to create a book that captures um, the spirit and the essence of Afghan food. So thank you. Yeah, and I think that you really have done a wonderful job of that because the cookbook, I mean, I love to cook. And so I'm always excited about any book that has like recipes that look amazing. But this book is like one of my very favorite kinds of books because it has the recipes, but really combined with the story, which I love. Mm -hmm. So I feel like it's your story. It's the story of Parwana, your restaurant. It's the story of your family. It's the story of a country. It's the story mm -hmm. of like, longing and displacement it's the story of like a, a homecoming so it's like yeah. all of that wrapped into one which is so beautiful I mean Thank and rare to see in a cookbook also mm. well I guess um you know you touch on something that was really important to me when I started to write this book and that was you know Afghanistan obviously a country which for so many people around the world just evokes images of only violence or suffering um and you know, I know that based on my own ancestry, my own history, my own story, um, that there is so much more to the story of Afghanistan. And, you know, that that is, for me, I've always had this in inkling that that's kind of wrapped up in the food. And as displaced people, you know, food became this really prominent part of our lives. So by the time my family left Afghanistan and we came to Australia, food was like this connection to our ancestry and our history, but also a means to eventually be able to share um, that beautiful kind of ancestry and history with people in our new home here in Australia. So. I knew that there was a much bigger story of Afghanistan that extends beyond just this kind of trapped, narrow vision of it of the last like few decades or so. Um, and I wanted to, it was really important to me to take the time to read and kind of find as many primary sources as I could and talk to my mum and dad and, you know, take on their, um, their, their knowledge, you know, which they're kind of one of the last generations to hold that knowledge of what Afghanistan was like before mm -hmm. this last kind of few decades of war. And so then when I wrote the book, it naturally evolved into um, this kind of multi-stranded approach. And one strand was really about the chronology. So going far back into history to talk about this beautiful intertwined history of Afghanistan that comes through in the cuisine, it's stamped into the cuisine. Um, but then another strand of it was definitely about, you know, my um, genealogy. So I wanted to tell the story through my mother because these are all her recipes and, you know, verbal kind of knowledge she's passed down to us. And in our world today, knowledge that's not written or academic or scientific seems to be undervalued. But, you know, to me, that's some of the most beautiful 
kind of and, and wise. <laughs> There's so much wisdom encoded in that. And I wanted to be able to capture that and share it. Um, and then there's also obviously my own personal voice as another strand and my experience has been one of um, displacement. My family left Afghanistan when I was one, um, not even one actually, and so my whole life began with that experience of exile and, and war. Um, and I thought that we, for a recipe book about Afghanistan and Afghan cuisine, it can't just be about the food because food is a proxy for people's lives, their culture, their story, their history, their moments. And I wanted to be able to weave all those strands together into the food um, and into the recipes to tell a much bigger story about Afghanistan and its people. And really it almost became an act of reclamation because so much of our history is told about us or imposed on us. Um, and even our present, you know, the present of the people of Afghanistan, there are just stories about us. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really important for me to tell the story through Afghan, Afghan eyes. You know, it is just my story and my perspective. And there's obviously multiple stories and a multitude of stories of Afghanistan. And, you know, this is one of them, but told through my eyes. And um, that felt like an act of reclamation. I love that. That's so powerful. I love that idea of like, I mean, that's what I think is really special about this cookbook is it's just so much bigger than a book that just contains recipes. And you touched on so many things that I want to talk about. So I want, <laughs> I want to start, there's a quote in here that I love that you say, the thing that I love most about Afghan food is that it is a direct rebuttal to the common narrative about Afghanistan. Um, and I think you can really feel that in the book. The book really conveys, I mean, first of all, there's a lot of history in the book. I learned so much about the history of Afghanistan, which was super interesting. And then also the book really conveys, I think does a great job of conveying the sense of both like the importance of hospitality in Afghan mm -hmm. culture and of family, and also this sense of generosity that you really, that really comes across. And yeah. I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about like, so for those of us who don't know that much about Afghan, before we get to your story and your family mm -hmm. story, who don't know that much about Afghanistan, could talk just a little bit briefly about the history of Afghanistan, yeah, but, but also especially about this sense of like the importance, the themes that really came across for me were this like hospitality, generosity, family, mm -hmm. the vibrance of the cuisine and of the people. I'd love it if you could talk a little bit about those things. Yeah, sure. So I'll start quickly with just um, this element of surprise. So many people that I've spoken to about the book already are just like, actually expressed shock in those words. Like I never knew that Afghan cuisine was so beautiful or I never knew that Afghanistan's history was so interconnected and so, you know, not peripheral, but like central to this ancient story of how civilization has evolved, right? And um, I love that. I love that people find it shocking because, you know, that's what stays with you. And it, one of my main kind of aims was you know, I wanted people to feel very challenged um, by what they think they know about Afghanistan or displaced people, migrants, refugees, you know, the Middle East in general today, you know, mm -hmm. because my aim was to say, you know, we have our stories, we have our histories and our ancestries and our present. We had our, you know, the promise of our own futures and all of that was kind of overrided and eclipsed by a geopolitical mm -hmm. kind of things but you know it's really important to stop and think about the potentials that were taken away because of that kind of thing like it wasn't just this inevitable thing that we had nothing and now that's why Afghanistan is in disarray we had so much richness and that's captured in our food <laughs> you know and in our stories um, so I really wanted that to come across in the book and I'm really glad that it has. Um, so just like a brief kind of um, explanation of where that all comes from, you know, Afghanistan is, um, well, what we know today as Afghanistan has only been called that for the last um, two or three centuries. Um, and before that, Afghanistan's always been this kind of really ancient land where people have settled for thousands of years. Um, and it's been a kind of, bricolage of different um, ethno-linguistic tribes um, and 
the influences so Afghanistan geographically sits at the center of the ancient Silk Roads and it's the heart of Central Asia um, and in ancient times these were the primary trade networks for um, right up until the 15th 16th century uh, that you know goods ingredients people ideas philosophies all crisscrossed and made their way around the world so what happened in Afghanistan because it was kind of like the crucible for this for this meeting of all these different cross, crossroads going north, south and east to west and back again, was it became encoded with this cross pollination of civilization that is, I think, the neglected story of um, humanity, right? And that's what I mean about it, the food kind of capturing um, this greater story of Afghanistan that's so much more prescient for our world today, that tells us so much more about how we can move forward than focusing just on narratives of suffering or violence or disconnection alone. So after that, so just some of the ancient civilizations that either passed through or stayed and settled in what we know as Afghanistan today, you know, there was the um, Achaemenid Persian Empire of Cyrus and Darius the Great. Um, and then there were the ancient Greeks. So Alexander the Great passed through, and even after he kind of moved on, um, his you know Greeks, the ancient Greeks stayed in Afghanistan for two, three hundred years longer. Uh, and there are actually you know they unearthed this um, Greek city, the furthest from Athens anywhere in the world, in what's today Afghanistan, right? Complete mm -hmm. with a gymnasium, a citadel, an acropolis. Um, and Greek language was used um, in the area and it's found on all the coins um, that, that's been found in Afghanistan. And then not only that, there were the ancient Mauryans, which was an ancient Indian empire and um, the kings like Ashoka the Great, they were Buddhists. So, you know, Buddhism kind of found a real spiritual home right there in Afghanistan. And still to this day, there are all these Buddhist stupas, like ancient ones that are there. And it spread into the rest of the world from Afghanistan. And, um, and then, you know, after that, there were um, Genghis Khan and that changed the face of Afghanistan and the whole world, you know. So all these kind of different ancient civilizations have passed through. And then Babur the Great, so the great Mughal Empire that ruled over India as well. And his final wish was to be buried back in Afghanistan, even though he had the throne of Delhi, which was the most prized throne you could have, right? Um, and so he's buried in Kabul in this garden called Baba Babur, which means the Garden of Babur. You know, so there's this great kind of rich history that is little known, but that has been stamped into our culture and our traditions. And it's very much a culture of generosity and hospitality. Um, Afghan food is inseparable from these traditions of hospitality that surround it. And a really big reason for that is this ancient history of exchange. So mm -hmm. kind of coming through these Silk Roads, you would have people that are either, you know, proclaimed to be messengers of divinity, like, or Astrianism or Buddhism or Sufism later on, right? Or you have people that are like merchants with riches to share potentially. So, mm -hmm. you know, you want to look after these people, their <laughs> guests, you know, so there's all this hospitality that's just embedded into how we treat people. And then add to that, that layer of the guest being seen as almost a divine incarnation, a blessing, right? And food for us in our culture as well is about blessings. And a very big part of Afghan tradition is that, you know, you don't just keep those things for yourself. You share your blessings. Mm -hmm. And that has just passed down. And, and like writing this book and kind of unearthing all of these things um, made me understand myself so much more because these were things that were ingrained in us as children. And, you know, my, like I mentioned earlier, my family left Afghanistan, we come to Australia, my whole lived experience is basically growing up in um, Adelaide. And mm -hmm. so I started to piece together um, all of these things about why hospitality is so important and why we always treat guests the way we do. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, the three that maybe if I could just summarize that three things that because of this ancient history of exchange and um, survival and, you know, um, thriving because of these interdependencies and cross pollination, you know, it brought to light for me that we have these neglected histories that um, that are about the importance of this exchange, this philosophical exchange, this exchange of ideas and goods, interdependency for survival, right? It's not just this um, human 
tendency to domination alone, which I think is the dominant narrative that shapes our world today, right? So that was like a really important thing that came through for me. And definitely, you know, yes, there is suffering. I don't mean to eclipse or override the suffering, especially now that people in Afghanistan um, face, right? But that in so many ways has made people even more generous and even more hospitable, <laughs> you know, and kind of my, when my sisters and I went back to Afghanistan, um, you know, we can talk about it a bit later as well, if you like, but, you know, we saw that, we saw that even through suffering and not having much at all, there was this greater kind of will to life where people found things more important than just material objects. And they still were willing to give you everything they had, even though there was very little. Um, and yeah, and then the other thing is just the vibrance that comes through in the food. And that's very much because of this history of poetry and aesthetics and art, you know, like people in Afghanistan, we, we love all those things and they're embedded into our culture and our cultural expressions because of this long history of opulence and, you know, gardens and um, beautiful ingredients uh, and, and appreciating those things. Yeah, I love that. I love both that as like kind of an antidote to modern Western society. And I think you really feel that in the book, both because everything is present. You have these pictures of family meals of the restaurant of like, you know, 10, 12 people gathered around the table, multiple generations, which is something that at least in America, you know, most people that I know don't get to experience that. So that is something that felt really just lovely about the book. And then also you talk about how um, Afghan food is often served, you know, basically family style. And so yeah. that's another thing that I really liked about it is I think that even for somebody like here cooking in Seattle or London or wherever you might be, it's a nice way to kind of tap into that spirit of like generosity of family meals of those beautiful ingredients. Yeah. And I was actually, I was so surprised that when I was looking through, you talk about this like um, about Afghanistan being at the heart of the Silk Road and all these different influences. And I was just blown away by the number of recipes that were kind of similar to recipes that I knew. Like there was, yes. like I, I wrote down some of the, there's like jalabi, which is like the Indian sweet That's and sab, sabzi, which I know is a Persian stew and mantu yeah. dumplings, which I know the manti, like the Turkish yeah, dumplings. But- so I was just like looking through the book and I was like, oh, this is like this or like that, but like with yeah. a little, with a different twist for me. And mm. so- you can really sense that, that you've had all this like Indian and Turkish and different influences, which is, I don't know, I just think it's very cool. <laughs> no, um, absolutely. You're touching on something that's really important in Afghan cuisine. Um, um, again, it's because of where it is um, geographically and these kind of histories of trade and settlement um, in the region. But yeah, I, I think that's another really amazing thing about Afghan food. Like when we have people kind of come into the restaurant or, you know, just even in discussions around the book and that kind of thing, um, Um, people, I think, find Afghan food, if at first they're surprised by how kind of similar or whatever it is, or that there's elements of it that they know um, in something else. And that kind of opens up this door to, well, you know, there's a strand of me or a piece of me or an ingredient in that dish that I know, or I know another variation of that dish. And yeah, it just speaks to this kind of fluidity of um, these the flow of these ingredients and these recipes. And Afghan cuisine is very much influenced by all of the countries around it. So you have like these really warm spices that you might traditionally associate with Indian cuisine, for example, like the cardamom and the cumin and, you know, those really warm kind of spices that we use in our food. Um, And the things like dals and naans and yogurt, you know, like these are kind of influences that have come in from the from beneath Afghanistan into Afghanistan. And then from the top, well, we, we're directly connected to, you know, the um, Asian countries. So you've got this um, Chinese and Mongolian influence in the dumplings and the hand rolled noodles, that kind of thing in our food. And then from the west of Afghanistan, we've got, you know, countries like Persia, so Iran, Turkey, the Middle East, Greece, you know, all of these are countries that were along those ancient silk roads and they come in and directly influence the food through things like, you know, lots of saffron in our food and lots of nuts. And see, this all mixes with what's native and indigenous to the region of Afghanistan itself. And what you have is 
dishes that are similar, but they've been blended together with native ingredients, for example, um, different apportioning of spices. So our food's quite aromatic and light, not too heavy. You know, so there's this blend of lots of things that are really familiar, but the way it's all kind of put together makes it something unique within its own right as well. And so I don't know, for me, it's very appealing because like, I love all of those cuisines and to see them yeah. combined in like new <laughs> or like, or like, to see them interpreted or presented in new and different ways. Like I just, like I said, I want to cook everything in the book. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, so I would love, okay, so I have another quote for you um, from the book. Another one that, that really like struck me. You talk about how when you and your family emigrated to Australia, food took a new poignancy and significance. Food was never static, but an ever evolving way to stay anchored to our history while filling our sails with hopes for tomorrow. And the whole book kind of unfolds how food was an anchor for you and your family. So mm -hmm. I was hoping that you could tell it, talk a little bit. I know you were only one when you mm -hmm. left um, Afghanistan, but if you could talk a little bit about the experience of your family, of your parents, yeah. of why, how, why and how you ended up in Australia and then how food plays into that. Yeah, sure. Um, big, so, big question. No, no, that's okay. So um, my, my family we um, left Afghanistan in 85 and this was the height of the Cold War and it was a time when, so the Cold War for people who might not know um, how it played out in Afghanistan, it was basically tensions playing out in Afghanistan between Soviet Russia and the US. Um, and it was really similar to other tensions that played out two centuries earlier. And then it was between Tsarist Russia and um, Britain, right? Mm -hmm. And that kind of influenced Afghanistan a lot in the 1800s and, and how its kind of politics and its trajectory played out. But in the last um, 30, 40 years or so, it was that kind of tension between the Soviets and the US that played out in Afghanistan and eventually meant um, all out war and devastation for Afghanistan and its people. So in the 70s, what happened was there was a coup d'etat and the king was overthrown. Um, he was a relatively moderate and just king. And during his time is when my grandparents and m m grew up and were what my mom and my dad were born into. And it was a time of peace and stability and a time when Afghanistan's own were trying to revolutionize and modernize the country, kind of in touch with everything that was happening around it. Um, and trying to build diplomatic ties with um, countries throughout Europe and America and, and Soviet Russia, um, while attempting to retain their own identity as Afghans and this you know, long history we've kind of just touched on. Um, the people that were in Afghanistan at that time in the 60s and 70s, um, there were a whole class of people that were trying to make that happen make this shift happen based on its own kind of intellectual um, and spiritual basis. And a really big part of that was the country's 1964 constitution. That meant that, you know, for the first time, it wanted to introduce um, rights for women, um, uh, modernize the country's education system, um, the first university in Kabul was built. Uh, and so it was a time when the country had hope, right? And this was the time that my parents grew up in. and. Um, they very much had futures that they were hoping for uh, in Afghanistan. And um, what happened was there was a communist influence that crept through into Afghanistan. And at the time in the world in the 60s and 70s, that, that was a really kind of prevalent and powerful force, right? Um, and so there was a, a party that was a communist party and they, they took power within Afghanistan um, and eventually what happened was political struggles, which meant that Soviet Russia invaded the country in 1979. And then from that point on, it was absolute kind of massacre and devastation for ordinary Afghan people. Lots of them, communism was a very foreign ideology for them and they couldn't take on the claims of what communism wanted them to be overnight the way it was expected. And that was a time that's actually really devastating for the country's modern history because by the 80s, so many people had left Afghanistan or you know, they had been killed or put in prisons or disappeared. And it was around that time that everything was very heightened that my family needed to leave. 
And so we made our way, um, you know, we had had family members disappeared or, you know, you kind of would hear whispers that my own father was next, that kind of thing, right? Because they refused to take on this communist ideology. And so we made our way out of the country. And the way we did that was on foot from um, Afghanistan into Pakistan. And there were lots of kind of UN United Nations based camps set up in Pakistan for the Afghan refugees. Uh, this was a time when over the half of the country's population went into exile. So if you can imagine the kind of social, intellectual, political mm -hmm. loss um, mm -hmm. the brain drain that happened mm -hmm. to Afghanistan in the, at that time, you know, that people that needed to be there had to leave. Yeah. And so um, that was when my family um, made our way quite perilously. <laughs> and I told the story as told to me by my mum and dad of how, you know, we had to doctor these papers, these travel papers, because leaving the country at the time was um, punishable. You know, you couldn't just leave. Right. And so mm -hmm. we had to have these travel papers and they were you had to pay the right people to try and get those papers. And eventually we get them. But we arrived to the border a day late. And so the papers basically say we're going into Pakistan for a family extended family members wedding but we get there a day late because of all sorts of things and so my dad had to like change the date on the paper to make it look like the wedding was the next day right and the border official looks at the paper and he knew straight away my dad says that you know it'd been tampered with and the border official says to my father you know you've missed the wedding and my dad said no 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 you know we haven't missed the wedding like it's tomorrow and he's like no I'm pretty sure you've missed it and he basically just says to my dad look I know you've tampered with these papers I know there's no wedding you know but take your family take your wife and just go and I wish mm -hmm. you a happy life and like don't come back so this is how we leave, <laughs> you know, and um, I can only imagine what that moment and those moments would have been like for my parents. You know, we had no real awareness of it as children, uh, yeah. but for my parents, you know, their generation are the ones that felt that loss. Um, and so eventually we um, in the camp, the camps aren't necessarily a very safe place either, because that's when yeah. this very fundamental version of Islam that kind of springs up in opposition to the communism, it kind of, that's its breeding ground. And so if you don't take on this really fundamental version of Islam, you're in danger then as well. So again, my father's in danger. And another stroke of luck, you know, we kind of, he bumps into an old family friend who's leaving for Australia like within a few days and he asks my dad to write down everyone's names and date of birth so he can take it back to his daughter who's or my aunt who's already here in Australia and we just have the good fortune of being sponsored over on a humanitarian grounds and and making a new life um, first in Melbourne for two years and then for for the rest um, ever since 89 here in Adelaide um, so yeah, it's, you know, as a child, you don't really understand and being able to write this book and ask my parents blow by blow, you know, where they were, how they were feeling was just a very kind of cathartic experience for me because it was the first time that I really understood it all mm -hmm. um, in depth and it made me appreciate um, their, their trajectory and everything they gave up for just a chance for us as children to have a future um, yeah, and it's um, it's shifting once you kind of get to explore that. Yeah, it was crazy when I was reading the story. It's so nerve wracking to hear about your family and like you're delayed and like I know. And, and and then is the guy gonna let you through the border? Like it was really. I mean, it really makes you think about what that experience is like. You know, like to be and then you yeah. arrive in the camps and you're still in danger because of fundamentalist Islamists. And it was just mm -hmm. so it was really um kind of eye-opening to to read that in a more first person perspective yeah it was definitely um revelatory for me as well like these are obviously always things I've known about my family's history and how we got here but not in you know asking my parents to conjure how that felt again for them you know that was something yeah. I put together and um I'm, I'm really glad I have had the chance to do that and have those conversations with my parents yes um, and speaking of your parents, I want to talk a little bit. So you're in Adelaide, like you're growing up in Adelaide and then you, it wasn't like you guys arrived and you had this like decades long, like um, you knew that you wanted to open a restaurant. You talk about how, what kind of wasn't the goal, but your mother just had this like intuition or this desire yeah. to, to share. So I'd love to yeah. hear about like 
why did you decide to open it? How was it? Was it difficult? Did people at the time, had people ever had Afghan food before? What was yeah. their reaction? Sure. Well, also, I, and I love, and can you, can you please talk about the name of the restaurant? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, well, I'll pick up from your last question because I realized I didn't answer. <laughs> when you said the quote you read before was about food being an anchor so by the time we come to Australia and I think this leads into why we opened the restaurants you know um as displaced people we had nothing in terms of like um material objects we had to start again right and so my parents had to do this with a very young family um and that's the experience of so many people who are quite skilled and kind of have had their futures and their prosperity and everything kind of taken away and they have to come into a new home and start again um and so for us in that journey which i guess is quite um it strips you bare in so many ways and so for us a uh, connection was through language so my sisters and I, we all grew up with Farsi as our first language and food, like food was the other huge thing. And I think um, it's a similar story for so many diaspora communities because food um, and especially Afghan food based on everything we've kind of already touched on, so much of it is about being together, you know, and when you've got nothing else, food and being together with your family, mm -hmm and kind of staying anchored and tethered to um, what now for my mom has just become like these memories of her former life and her ancestry and her history. It becomes almost even more amplified in your life yeah. in a new home, right? And so food was so central and so much so formative in our experience growing up as children. And I have these recollections of, you know, gathering with like family and friends and, you know, you find joy in sitting down and folding dumplings together or like rolling out these flatbreads and frying them and like eating them all together and that's another huge part of the traditions that surround afghan food you know everything's kind of prepared together right and then you sit and eat together so it was really a, a huge kind of anchor and connection to our identity um growing up and for the way the restaurant eventually comes about is because you know my mom in afghanistan so she um, her mother passed away when her and her siblings were all really quite young. So my mum was just four years old when her mum passes away. And they were raised by their father, who is kind of this larger than life figure, but is very loving and kind of encourages them to pursue what they love and that kind of thing. And for my mum, it's just always naturally been cooking. So she's just telling me all these stories of you know, the way they would cook things, the way kids cook things, you know, you just grab everything you can from a pantry, <laughs> run away and try and like mix it all together <laughs> to make something awful. And then everyone has to pretend they like it, you know, so this is just what she's naturally inclined to do ever since she was small. And so because of she loves it and she's naturally inclined towards it, she spends time in the kitchens where people are like preparing all of this very traditional Afghan food and she absorbs the way it's all prepared. And I guess that kind of fuels her love for it even more. And I think a thing to note about traditional Afghan cuisine is, you know, the techniques and the history and, and the way it's all done is because of this mass exile of people and because of like the war and the scattering effect on culture of war, you know, being able to carry that on is an act of preservation, right? So for us, opening the restaurants became this thing that just went from everyone loves my mom's food here in Australia. And, you know, she would just kind of prepare food for community events or you know when someone was having a wedding they would be like can you please prepare the food because it's so good and it just kind of naturally evolved from being asked to do things for people into people outside of the community trying her food and going wow you know like we didn't know this is what Afghan food was this is great and so eventually she decides that you know because of the importance of preserving this food we have to kind of be able to do something a little bit more with it. And that's her intuition with the kind of recipes that she knows that have been passed down to her. And so we opened just like a little kitchen and a storefront and, you know, no one had any experience or any like grand designs around like having a restaurant or being in the industry, nothing like that at all. It was just my mum cooks this amazing food and people seem to like it. Let's see what can happen next, you know? And if nothing else, she's got a small space to do catering from. Um, yeah. 
but then people just kind of keep stumbling across it and they love it and um, it just kind of really organically grew um, in following and in size so you know we're kind of expanded into like the spot next door and so and now it's you know taught us so many things about the importance of food and what it means to be displaced people and what it means to kind of start to merge your identity to hold on to your history while evolving um, in the new home that you're in you know how you kind of do that balance and so much of it is reconciling, you know, reconciling to transform. So as displaced people, we'll always have these kind of memories of loss and suffering and this kind of poignancy attached to all of that. And that is captured in the food. But then inseparable from that is this opportunity and this chance to like live peacefully you know so what are you going to do with that <laughs> you know and so for me I really realized as I was writing this book that that experience of being displaced and having your identity taken away from you in every conventional sense um, and having lots of assumptions imposed on you was really this gift to pry a lot deeper into what identity is and what it means to be human and what parts of that human story you can take and reconcile and create something new with. And the word pawana means butterfly in our traditional language in Farsi. And when we chose, we kind of had like two or three names that we were trying to choose from. This is years ago when we first opened the restaurant before anything, right? Before we knew how busy we would be or how much people would kind of enjoy the food. And we thought Parwana was the name of a place that my parents used to go when they were living in Kabul, like in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. like a, a restaurant and people loved it. Um, but then we also thought, so it kind of had that kind of nostalgia attached to it for them but then we also thought that parwana is just a beautiful word you know it means butterfly and it's easy to say and people even if they weren't familiar with the language would be able to say it and then I the more I thought about it and as I was writing this book I thought you know so much of the story of food in our lives and the story of parwana and our restaurants has been about our own transformation you know mm -hmm. and the book is kind of like the next part of this transformation of our identity you know and i just thought the word parwana is so apt because of the metamorphosis you know that it allowed us to um, experience uh, and so i feel really grateful for this kind of deep connection with food and um, my culture and my history through food because it's really helped me kind of understand where I've come from and be anchored and tethered to that history but also it's fluid enough to create the space for you to turn it into what you need it to be for your present and your future. That's so beautiful. When you're talking about the name, it just like gives me chills. It's like so apt on so many levels and kind of about this story of, yeah, of transformation of your family and your family story. Mm -hmm. um, I also, and I love that how um, just the book and, and everything that you're talking about today really reminds us. I mean, I think food is incredibly trendy right now, like with Instagram mm -hmm. and social media and cookbook mm -hmm. publishing you know, it's, it's a very, it's very hip to kind of know the latest thing and be cooking the latest thing, but it's such a good reminder and such a good way to kind of be grounded in the tradition of food and the real importance of food. And you talked at the beginning of this, um, of our discussion about how anything that's not overly like intellectual or mm -hmm. codified or whatever is kind of taken less seriously, but listening to you talk, it's such a good reminder of how very important that tradition of food and gathering and family and carrying on stories and reconnecting us to our roots is it's it's truly like incredibly valuable so I, I don't know I love hearing that about oh that. thank you Alea no I absolutely agree I think that you know it's so much of expressions cultural expressions gets hijacked by things that are really quite superficial right <laughs> and yeah. um but the depth of it is still there and you know we can make choices around how we want to engage with those things and for me and my family and our restaurants um it could never have been anything other than a commitment to sharing what my mum knew um, and a kind of organic expression of what food meant for us as displaced people. Uh, and that's something that 
I hope comes through in the book and that I'll hold on to really strongly because um, it's so much more than, you know, a photo opportunity in a trendy restaurant or <laughs> being able yeah. to call an experience authentic or whatever, you know, like there are so many more layers that can be unearthed for all of us. Um, and I hope that's what comes across in um, the restaurants and in the book. I can't speak to the restaurant, but uh, absolutely in the book. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, we have a little bit more time. So I would like, I have, I have many, many more questions for you, but I will pick kind of the top yeah. ones. Yeah. Um, I would love for you to talk about, so in 2012, so you left Afghanistan when you were less than one. And then mm -hmm. I don't think you went back until 2012, if, I'm, if I yeah, remember correctly. Yeah. So I'd, I'd love to hear as somebody who grew up as part of the Afghan diaspora, but in a completely separate country, like what it was like to go back um, and then yeah. how that led to you opening also, uh, is it Kuchi Deli Parwana? Kuchi Deli, yeah, our little lunch yeah. spot in the city. Yeah. Um, well, that experience of having spent the bulk of my life um, in Australia as, you know, 2012 when we went back I was in my mid-20s you know and I had no real kind of understanding of um I guess Afghanistan other than you know food language things that had been passed on to me I guess secondarily through my parents right and their stories and um people that you meet in your diaspora community and so when we went to Afghanistan I could not have imagined the kind of connection and that sense of homecoming that I felt when I got there. And I remember, I write about it in the book, we basically did the reverse journey of what my parents were forced to do like 25, 27 years earlier, whatever it was. You know, we had to pass out of Afghanistan into Pakistan. My grandma, my mum's mum is a poet, you know, and or she's passed away, but she was a poet and she was a kind of like this nationally recognized poet, uh, one of the only female poets. And one of her, I, I had this really great experience of being able to kind of read um, some of her poetry and translate it with my mom, kind of like while I was researching this book and read what other people had written about her. Um, and one of her poems is just like a sentence from it. And it basically said that the spring, the eyes of the spring clouds of Afghanistan weep for its people because of this kind of tribal factionalism and stuff that was happening. And when I write about it in the book, I said, you know, when my parents bundled us up as children and moved into these horizons unknown, you know, that day must have truly come for them, that the eyes of the clouds were weeping for them, right, because they're stepping out into the unknown. And so for us to kind of do the reverse of that experience, my sisters and um, my nieces and my brother-in-law and I to do the reverse of that trajectory and go back into Afghanistan was always going to be a powerful thing, but I didn't really realize it as it was happening. Um, and then when I was reflecting, I kind of brought up my journals because I always keep journals about like things that um, I life right and so when I was in Afghanistan I had been journaling and I pulled out these journals and I realized just how much it impacted me just being back in Afghanistan and that connection that you feel online like I just started crying when we got into Afghanistan and I couldn't tell you why <laughs> you know and I think it's just because you know your essence and your spirit has been there and um, that of your ancestors has been there. And, you know, that's a really important part of how you navigate the world, whether you feel that connection or whether it's been severed. And for the first time, that connection was put back together and it ran through me, you know, and um, sorry, I'm getting a bit emotional now, no, which is okay. Strange, but, um, you know, it was undeniable just um, how connected I felt and how much more I wanted to do for Afghanistan. And that meant feeling kind of discovering more about myself because um, of everything I didn't know about myself, which is a very common story of what happens to people when they're displaced from a young age. Um, 
And so the book was this experience, researching for it and reading for it and writing it was an experience in kind of making that picture more whole. But when we were in Afghanistan, um, you know, I was just overwhelmed by so many things, the kindness of the people despite their suffering and, you know, and definitely not to romanticise um, the country. It's a beautiful, beautiful landscape, you know, um, there's the Hindu Kush mountains. We got there in spring, so everything was really green. There's like these kind of pristine little lake, um, rivers and lakes that run through. And yeah, not to romanticize it because you see the war as well. You know, you see the poverty, the crumbling buildings, that kind of thing. But again, like even through all that, there was this spirit of resilience and this humanness that you know we forget in places where you have abundance and you've got nothing yeah. to worry about but in those places you know that's what people hold on to and that's what gets them through every day and they still do it with generosity and kindness and it was um just such an experience to be there and to see the food as well you know we went to this place called Dari Nur and um that translates to the valley of light essentially and it was just like unlike anything I've ever experienced. Um, and it was this small valley kind of nestled at the bottom of um, mountain ranges and, you know, everything there was self-sufficient. So we had like this bread made with local grains, cheeses made from like local kind of dairy and um, livestock and kind of um, vegetables grown on site. And tea brewed from water from like the well that comes from like the mountain <laughs> water that gushes down you know and so it was like this totally kind of organic experience like organic afghan food in this valley <laughs> you know in the, in the middle of the kind of mountains and it was just so beautiful and imprinting and you know the other thing we saw was like the way they kind of do street food over there still so like these little kind of shop front or carts vendors with carts and they just make the most delicious food with not a lot right like just like a few utensils and like a pot or a pan and um and then there were lots of bright colors still like still this focus on art and painting walls really brightly and that kind of thing despite everything happening around and you know, that was kind of that, that essence stayed with me and stayed with us, um, my sisters and I. And when we came back to um, Australia, we um, a few months later, you know, we were in the process of kind of deciding that we wanted to um, do the next version of or add to the story of Pawana. And for my sisters and I, it was like, well, our relationship to food as this kind of generation of people um, within a displaced family where our experience is much more about we've grown up, spent the bulk of our life in Australia, our connection to that food and that history is slightly different. So how can we kind of capture that and share it? And going to Afghanistan was a huge part of that. So we came back, we opened up our little lunch spot. It's small, it's really brightly tiled, fluorescent lights, you know, a simple menu, but like just a focus on good ingredients and getting like those flavors and tastes right um so yeah it was a really kind of um uh an experience that stayed with us in so many ways and shaped what we did with our um with our food story here as well I love that I love how all aspects of your business are kind of tied into like the story and tradition and the idea of it's so powerful the idea of you guys in some way like reversing or like going full circle the path that mm. your, your family tra traveled that's really lovely thanks Leia. Yeah. um so I would love to ask before let's see we have a few more minutes like eight more minutes I would love to ask um specifically some questions about the book so sure. uh you talked actually you talked a little bit about um some common ingredients and some indigenous in ingredients mm -hmm. to Afghanistan but mm -hmm. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about ingredients like what are some common flavors for people who don't know what are those indigenous yeah, ingredients? Sure. sure. So um, uh, the spice bases that make up almost all Afghan food. Um, well, actually, so there's this spice mix that people kind of make to taste and it varies from region to region and family to family, you know, but it's called char masala. And that means like four spices, but there can be more than four spices in the mix. So things like, and um, we have a recipe for it in the book of what we kind of use in our like restaurants and in my kind of passed down to my mom. And so it's things like cinnamon, bay leaves, um, the brown cardamom pods, um, coriander, um, cardamom, the normal, the smaller green cardamom pods, cumin, cloves, 
these are really typical kind of spice bases in Afghan food. And for char masala, you would toast all those spices and grind them and just keep a jar. And every time you cook, you know, like a curry or something, you would add that to the sauce base. Mm-hmm. And then a lot of our sauce bases are ingredients like tomatoes, onion, garlic, kind of caramelized onions and garlic, and then fresh tomatoes. Uh, and then you would add maybe whatever vegetable it is you're having with that, like a braised, like a pumpkin that you would kind of fry or an eggplant, mm-hmm. which is like one of yeah. our signature dishes. <laughs> <laughs> and also, you know, these are all ingredients that were grown in Afghanistan. Um, mm-hmm. And then another huge, and so and a lot of Afghan food is about layering. So you would kind of cook the veggies or meat or whatever it is in that kind of a sauce and spice base. And then with the vegetables, for example, we have a dish called borani, which means that you kind of layer it with like a garlic and salt infused yogurt and then top it with like fresh or dried herbs. And then you would have that with a rice or some naan or something like that. The other thing to know about Afghan food is you know, it's typically a spread, um, especially when you have guests or something like that. You know, it's not just a plate of food, for example, Mm -hmm. but you would have rice with dumplings, with curries, and then naans, accompaniments, yogurts, that kind of thing on the side. So overall, you've got a really great mix of like spice and aroma um, and that kind of warmth that comes through in the spices and then like acidity and cooling of like yogurt and then that freshness of like toppings and herbs and that kind of thing. Uh, And another huge part of Afghan cuisine is rice. So Afghanistan was a rice growing part of the world and it's Mm -hmm. got the right conditions for um, to grow really beautiful rice. Um, And Afghans are obsessed with rice. (laughs) And it's the kind of if you capture that technique of cooking the rice well and right, you've kind of mastered Afghan cuisine. Um, And I go there's a lot of detail in the book about the different kinds of rices that we do. And um, they're all usually, you know, the more elaborate ones are topped with like really beautiful native like nuts so like almonds Mm. pistachios all grown in the region um and Mm -hmm. things like sultanas and and carrots that kind of thing so or like a citrus rind so we have a orange palau which is um kind of made with this candied orange rind um and that was native to the region you know and so it's this real fusion of things you might not think to mix together like the savory like the rice with sweet things but it all just works together so well and especially when you have it with lots of other things around it yeah and just to give everybody an idea like here are some I don't know if you guys can see like they just look like amazing Um, like is this the one with the candied citrus yes, zest? and the orange pillow is with the candied orange pillow yes <laughs> okay, that, that looks gorgeous mm-hmm. um I see somebody asked this in the Q&A but I want to go ahead and ask now I was going to ask you like I, I don't know if you can choose between your your kind of your family recipes but do you have what are some favorites oh um I love our, I've talked about it a lot already, but I do love our rice dishes. I think they're just really special. And there's a whole process around how you make them um, that makes the rice really kind of separate and fluffy um, and and just beautiful because we also spice it with like really kind of aromatic kind of spices. So things like cardamom, cinnamon, that kind of thing, but just really lightly. Um, And one of my favorite rice dishes in the book is the marsh palau, which is a mung bean rice. Um, I don't remember what page it's on. Oh, I opened straight to it. Page 125 <laughs> is the mash palo. And it's this beautiful, the reason I love it is because the mung beans are really quite earthy. And so you have this real earthy taste in the rice, but then there's all sultanas through it as well. And so you get these like bursts of sweetness too. And then when you pair that with something like the eggplant that's kind of smothered in yogurt it's just the most delicious thing you can have wow. um, and then another favorite is the bolani which is the um the stuffed flatbreads that's oh. only on the book somewhere oh yes here they are so and the reason i love the bolani that's just the page showing um you know the how you would roll them out and Um, make them is because you can stuff them with whatever you feel like Um, so they kind of end up being these crispy flatbreads that you dip into like chutneys and sauces or yogurts but um, you just fill them with whatever is seasonal or whatever you feel like Um, we fill them with uh, like a native leek um, or um, 
potato filling, like a really delicious potato that you would cook with onion, that kind of thing. And then by the time you stuff it in this hand rolled kind of dough and fry it and then dip it into something, you know, a bit chilly or, or some yogurt on the side, it's just the most delicious thing you could have. <laughs> so they're awesome. a few of my favorites. <laughs> that sounds amazing. Um, and what about, I was wondering if you could recommend for somebody who's maybe more of a beginner cook, where, where mm. is there a recipe that you can think of would yeah. be a good starting place? Well, um, Afghan food is, I think one of the nice things you'll find is that it's quite simple to make. Um, I would probably start with some of the curries. So like there's a chickpea curry in the book, um, just to kind of get a feel for the flavors and the spices that we use. Um, and then work your way up to things like the rices and the dumplings, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I would, yeah, I'd probably start with some of the curries, like some of the meat curries or the spinach, um, which we call sabzi, cello, sabzi cello, um, something like that, just to get a feel for um, how the flavors all work together. Um, and they're really quite, quite straightforward to make and you don't need much at all in terms okay. of equipment and utensils. Lovely. I love it. Um, okay. It looks like it's 3.30. So let's um, look at the Q&A. And if anybody has any anything to add to the, the Q&A, please do. So here's one from Indrani Da Silva. So mm -hmm. Afghanistan flavors are complex, rich, and colorful due to the interesting and unique ingredients. I love the idea of cooking this food, but often find it challenging to find uh, all the ingredients. Mm -hmm. Do you have any resources, even online, where you can source Persian ingredients? Um, and are there some substitutes that you can use that may be more readily that are maybe more readily available? Okay. Do you mention these resources in the book? This is a great question. Yeah. Um, yes, um, we do kind of mention anywhere you could kind of find something more easily than what would have been found in Afghanistan. <laughs> I do mention it. We mention it in the book. Um, so even things like utensils, for example, like to make the mantle, you need like a steamer pot um, and you can find those usually in Asian stores. Um, so like a Chinese grocer or something like that, because they kind of do the same dumplings, right? So the mm -hmm. steamer pots you can find there. And then same with the ingredients. A lot of our ingredients, if you don't have like a Persian grocery store, you could find it maybe in an Indian grocery store, which are usually a bit more prevalent or even, yeah, again, like the Chinese grocers. So things like basil seeds, which we call, um, which are called subja, um, you know, you can find that in an Asian grocer or... Okay. Um, anywhere we can kind of substitute things so for example we have gandana which is like a native leek which you can really not find anywhere right but um you can just substitute that for a leek um okay. so i kind of try to mention that as much as i can throughout the book of where you can find ingredients that are a bit more unusual um and even the nut orange, for example the orange rind um traditionally it's not an orange it's kind of like this fusion citrus found in afghanistan but mm -hmm. in countries like australia and america where you know, the diaspora lives, they would probably just use an orange, <laughs> okay. you know, so I kind of go into that a little in the book. So I hope that helps. Okay, great. Excellent question. Um, here's a question from, I'm totally going to butcher this name, I feel, Idel Garipov. Mm -hmm. So what were some of the challenges you faced whilst writing Parwana and how did you overcome them? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think I was so committed to writing the book and I, I guess one of the challenges was that life goes on like it was this very immersive experience and I had to find space and time to you know kind of wind down after a day in the kitchen and then come home to write <laughs> you know so it's like this real shift of being around people and being quite physical and you know doing kind of quite active things to being in this space that is really immersive and quiet and personal um, and being able to kind of challenge that while the demand the demands of life don't stop you know like you've got your family and mm -hmm. your work and, and I was really busy with a lot of other things I was doing with my fellowship at the time as well and there was a lot of travel involved in that kind of thing so just really finding a way to stay connected to that feeling you get when you kind of immerse yourself in writing. Um, that was, yeah, the biggest challenge was just finding the space and time to do that. Um, another thing was that I wanted to stay very true to as much as I could, to this being an ex, like a 
reflection of my experience as like a writer and trying to capture like my family's voices, my mum and dad's and my sister's voices. But, you know, there's always this tension of you don't want people to think you're speaking for an entire people, which is always kind of what happens to kind of marginalised communities. You speak with your voice and it gets projected like onto everyone. So I want, I was really conscious of saying this is but one story of like a multitude of stories and experiences. Um, and to just be very true to that. Um, so yeah, in some ways the challenges were also what made me appreciate the whole experience even more. Okay, excellent, thank you. And then our last one is from Jackie Vaselli. Um, I don't have a question, but I just wanted to say thank you very much for this. I bought the book from the store a few weeks ago and I already love it. This conversation has also been such a breath of fresh air. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, <laughs> I hope you enjoy the book. That's beautiful. So, so before I turn it back over to Paulina, I just, I just want to say also thank you that it's just been, I've loved, I loved like dive, delving into the book on kind of a deeper level and reading all the text, reading about your family and like hearing your story. It's just been so inspiring. And like I said, this is the kind of cookbook that is just like the kind of book that is near and dear to my heart that has like recipes that look amazing, but also that like, you just feel it's full of like heart. You can feel the love that went into it. So I just want to say thank you. And it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you, Alea. And um, yes, I just want to echo that and say how grateful I am to be able to share with you and with listeners. Um, and thank you so much for having me. Ladies, thank you so much for, for um, putting together this really beautiful conversation. I agree with Jackie, it was a, bre a breath of fresh air. Um, thank you to everyone who tuned in and listened the past hour. Again, you can um, order um, Drakani's beautiful book through Book Larder. Uh, we have signed copies and I paste, uh, copy and pasted the link into the chat, but you could also just find it on our website. But again, thank you all around. Thank you, ladies. Thanks so much. Take care. Take care.